Uh, our objective was to explore biochar ovens which can uh, uh, take a range of feedstocks simultaneously as done in traditional cultures. We want to put wood and bark and leaves and urine, straw and grass and soil and clay and minerals all in there and still make it work. Uh, using those materials uh, locally to make enhanced biochars that fit into small-scale agronomic practice where well, you want to put something in the soil and get a result right away rather than wait a year or so on and you don't want to spend too much money uh, but we still want low and tested emissions at minimal capital expense uh, leading to a lot of experimentation that helps push this thing forward because it's not really happening from top down very well governments aren't really supporting this yet so that was our objective uh, just to touch on the, and relate to what we've just done, there's three methods of heating, internal heat, external heat transfer, and circulating gas. The first one is, is uh, what Paul called oxic, and the second one anoxic. I love the TLAP that like, uh, Carl was talking, because you can't scale them up beyond 200 liters, but you can use multiple of them. The retort, this one is the book of Gunther double barrel, uh, where the material you want to char is inside the retort, there's no air in there. Uh, but the gas can escape easily, that's important. You don't want to put stuff in a retort and throw it on a fire and underway for the gas to escape. But the limitation there is you really can't scale up too much either because the heat transfer doesn't go in very well if you have a big, uh, big kiln or it's packed with sawdust or big logs. So the, the third method is exemplified here by the atom retort where you have a retort, you have a firebox. It's pretty efficient because it's insulated, it's masonry and you transfer the uh, um, hot combustion gas from the firebox right through the fuel, which drives out the water. So now we were a little bit inspired by the Japanese model where they have a, have a firebox at the opening to the kiln and they combust the gases inside the kiln but it radiates heats down onto the, the stuff you're trying to char. So this is our first kiln. It was a two cubic meter commissioned by somebody in a biochar plantation because <clears throat> they wanted that size. It's an insulated uh, uh, kiln box, a firebox, and gas from the firebox pass into the kiln and we can wheel in a cart full of bamboo or whatever and pass the gases up through there. <clears throat> and then we can also take some of the hot flue gases and bring them above the cart and distribute them through holes from a tube so that we um, have hot air and we can crack any tires coming off. Then we bring in the secondary air through another couple of tubes and we have a flare shroud which can bring in tertiary air. And in the, in the, in the flare area we have a LPG torch just to light things up and keep things going and crack any more tires. Now one innovation is we have a way to drip water onto a hot plate in a firebox and that generates steam which helps condition the char and also can control the temperature. So design wise I implemented that with a uh, hebel block here which is an insulating um, cementation block for the, for the firebox we just use regular bricks you have to use a little bit of cement to join things together but it's a side loading firebox and it's a baffle in there so the hot gases rise over the baffle and get distributed below the cart and above the cart. The cart actually has a door attached to it so when we close up, when we wheel the cart and we wheel the door in and it, it closes on a seal because the lady who commissioned that uh, a bamboo plantation, she was elderly and she wanted to be able to handle this by herself. So here you see the cart loaded with bamboo stacked vertically so the heat transfers well up through the bamboo. Sometimes we soak the bamboo in mud like traditional cultures or fill it with, with chicken shit uh, inside the bamboo. But we stack it in there and start heating it with the firebox. And we take a day maybe to heat it and then the next day fire. So one of the important objectives here was to get an even heat distribution by the way we distribute the holes in the tubes. So in the side wall of the Hebel block kiln, we have nine holes that we can stick thermocouple probes in, like illustrated there in the center. And we often would just leave one hole in the reference, in a reference location, say in the center, so we could monitor the temporal change, and then we move the other probe around to monitor the spatial change. And as you can see here, it was somewhat uniform in the kiln, but by the time we got to 
thermocouple uh, position number six, which was at the firebox end, it was getting up to 145, 150, which experience told us we might get ignition there. Uh, probably because there's a spark coming in and the material's very, very dry and it can ignite at quite low temperatures and it's very dry. So we have to rush and close everything, and, uh, but now we have a fire in the kiln and it's running a bit like a tea lab now inside the kiln. Uh, to try to control, oh, here's some pictures of the firebox, side loading firebox. Disadvantage with side loading firebox is that you get a blast of air when you open the door. So the next time we would definitely do an end loading firebox, uh, as, as big as we can get. Uh, and then in the other two pictures, you see the syngas burning around the, the air tube. And so it looks like gas jets up there, but it's really, really air jets coming in from the air tube. And they're coming into a container filled with syngas, which is the big kiln, and combusting right there like gas jets. Um, not much chance of explosion, of course, because it's very open. Uh, and that's the bamboo chart produced. Now, in order to try to control the early ignition on the kiln, we put the bamboo horizontally. We mixed it with clay and chicken manure. Uh, we still got early ignition. We pulled the car out. You can see it starting at one end. And in that particular case, we could actually watch the combustion front progress sideways across the kiln. So it was like a sideways tea lab. There was probably a leak under the door, firebox at this end, if it shows that way up there. Firebox at one end where the smoke is, maybe a leak at the other end. But we could bring the cart out, the whole load of it, put it back in, and we just die down again because limited air inside the kiln. And we would quench it afterwards. We had a trough beneath there to catch the quench water, which in effect is smoke water, and we can use that to uh, condition the chow afterwards and put in the garden. Now, just to look at the energy balance, for pyrolyzing 200 kilograms of feedstock, which is the amount of bamboo we can get in that two cubic meter kiln, and also about the amount of limb water or, or hog fuel we could pack into the uh, one cubic meter kiln I'm going to show you next. So, 200 kilograms uh, makes 50 kilograms of water, 150 kilograms of dry wood left, which breaks down to about 50 kilograms of biochar and 100 kilograms of syngas, assuming 25% moisture content and 25% biochar yield of 33% dry weight. So for the, for the energy, we use 20, uh, let's say 13 megajoules per kilogram for the, the, the wood and 26 for the char, which is pretty representative. And the net result of that, the energy balance is that it takes about 5% of the energy in the wood to evaporate the water, 3% to heat the dry biomass up to 280 degrees where it pyrolyzes, and the typical heat loss is 5% through the kiln walls. And then of the original energy, 50% is distributed between, between the uh, biochar and the syngas each. And in our case, providing that 5% and that 3% to get to high uh, pyrolysis from the outside. To consider the power levels, you have to consider the time. So we, uh, if we want to dry the stuff in two hours, and you get 60% of your energy out of the fuel, whatever it is that you're using to dry the kiln, wood in the firebox in this case, uh, if you can apply 60% of that heat, then it takes 30 kilowatts, and that same 30 kilowatts will dry the wood in about one hour, and it will cover the heat loss represented there as an energy uh, in a couple of hours. But notice that the syngas <coughs> puts out 360 kilowatts, assuming you get all the syngas out in one hour. So quite a lot of energy in that syngas, and you've got to be prepared to handle that. So uh, our kiln, by the way, I, I won't go back to it, but it had water sprays that we could spray water into the kiln to control the temperature or control the the process because uh, a lot of energy in there. So now, if we want to generate our syngas, I mean our energy from the syngas by recycling it, uh, it takes about 16% of the energy in the syngas on this analysis to initiate pyrolysis and only 10% to take care of heat loss. So pyrolysis syngas is not a good match to a batch kiln because you don't have pyrolysis until you initiate it. And when you do initiate, you don't need much of it to, to uh, to take care of heat loss to go well, well insulated kiln. So it's just to have a dual retort where you have one firebox <coughs> driving two kilns and you can switch the syngas to, to operate and dry the other one. You follow me? Yeah. So, uh, and then at the same time, 
it only takes four or six kilograms of propane to initiate pyrolysis in that whole big retort. So that, those considerations led to this design uh, to try to study things further, which is a 0.9 meter cube car inside a 1.2 meter cube kiln that's insulated with 50 millimeters of insulation. And we transferred the syngas totally out of the space and flared off in a separate chimney in preparation one day to use it for driving another kiln or doing other things with it. Uh, if you do a heat loss calculation, you'll find that if it's 700 degrees inside, it'll be 120 degrees outside, which is just about was with your <coughs> hand on it, and there'll be 1.5 kilowatts per meter squared, which pretty much matches that 5% rule of thumb of heat loss. Uh, you can buy tube burners like this. this. These are 90 centimeters and 15 kilowatts. Two of those will provide our 30 kilowatts. And we use a, and that's in the bottom there, inside a, uh, a tube with a way to close off air when you want to stop it. And then we use a ring burner in the flare chimney to make sure everything stays lit and tires are cracked and so on. So that's the uh, exemplification of that on my property in Australia. We, this is uh, fired up the first time the day I left. So we just did it with a little bucket, of a little blue bucket there of wood. But uh, over on the bottom corner is, shows that we scavenged a couple of barbecues. So we have seven barbecue burners in there, each five kilowatts. And you can see the knobs under the kiln. You can see the kilns put together in parts. There's the, the bottom part, the, the, the kiln, the cart, the track, and the flare chimney, which is not complete. Uh, the outside of it's made of just six millimeter cement sheet you can buy at Home Depot, and then it's, uh, which is quite cheap and easily cut, and then it's insulated with thermal wool. So I'll move on to our infill pyrolysis, which we developed as a low cost method of, of uh, burning, of, of processing crop residues in the field. Uh, and it's based on traditional practices. Uh, Stephen Joseph here is in uh, Nepal, but you see these practices everywhere. They're digging the ground, they lay the straw on the ground, they lay smoldering dung on the biomass, leaf litter on top of that, cover it with soil, let it smolder three days, and then let it stand a couple of weeks before. And so it's always a mixture of feedstocks, always involves soil, uh, and involves a range of temperatures from low to high in traditional practice. It's all over the world, it must have worked. So we want to see if we can do that as well in the modern age. So this is what we call our little root, little kangaroo. Uh, you can set up your, your feedstock, say bales of hay, straw layered with, with, with uh, minerals and clay in between, and then just move the little root over the top. Uh, you can see the wheels there in the center picture on lever, so you can just lower the cart down on the ground, uh, burns cleanly, and lift it and wheel it back away again. Now, with that, our ultimate vision was a big room, so I'll go into the concept of that. Uh, it's, this one covers a seven meter cube, so you can put two tons of biomass inside. It's carried in place by a tractor. It's 40 millimeter square tube with two millimeter steel um, all around. It has a heat shield to protect the roof, insulated <coughs> with uh, rigidized refractory wall. It's got an LPG burner to crack the gases, as usual practice, and just to go through how it works, we have an external gasifier to provide hot air. We also have a small gen set in the field to, to send the flue gases in. And the gases from both of those can go into these uh, tubes at the bottom with baffles above them and go up the side of the kiln and, and to some extent through the biomass and actually get it up, dry it out, and get it up to torrification. And then is when we uh, ignite it by putting a burner through those air holes and we ignite it from the top. And what happens then is we, we have air pipes, uh, a couple of them below the shield, a couple above, and so the, <coughs> the syngas partially burns in that space below the shield, radiates heat down in the biomass and it, it, it pyrolyzes from the top down to the bottom. And then uh, uh, we have tertiary air coming in as well around the stack so we get good clean combustion. And then the water sprays. The water sprays allow us to control the temperature and introduce the steam that conditions the chart. So there's a, sort of the design, two millimeter thick steel. The heat shield has apertures in it about equal in size to the apertures in the two chimneys. And 
that's the implementation. It's just been completed as of a couple of days ago. So I just got these uh, pictures yesterday. This is all by Russell Burton down at Biochar Energy Systems in uh, Victoria. But you can see the idea we have. And so you can just take this anywhere in the field and drop it over uh, and, and pyrolyze. So now, uh, just as a comparison, another system in Australia, this was developed to, for, to deal with stranded biomass current solution burner in the field, new solution, a uh, container-sized system they developed by starting with barrels, just like Carl was talking about, etc., and experimenting, uh, and, then, and then rapidly moving to developing this uh, container-sized system, 13 uh, meter cube batches, cost a quarter million dollars. Uh, we wanted that big roux to cost $20,000. So uh, another system that's a commercial system, the Pireg in, in uh, Germany, I just visited them the other day. Uh, there's four of these in, in Europe. You can see a massive feedstock on one side. That goes through there in one day and produces that massive flash on the other side. They're always integrated into composting uh, situations in Europe. They cost $400,000 in Europe. So uh, here's our version of a continuous pyrolyze. It's totally open source. Uh, as soon as we get developed, it will be published for consumption. Uh, but it's designed to be manufactured in small engineering workshops, to transport portable by truck, only one motor and one fan. Uh, the biochar, uh, feed and removal feedstock can be manual or automatic. Everything can be manual or automatic. If it's manual, we drop the biochar into a biochar bin. If it's automatic, we take it off with a screw conveyor that you see there. And here's, don't read the fine print because I'm, oops, totally screwed up. That's going to be hard. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this is funny. <laughs> Bear with me a second. Okay, so I can't show you everything, but if you look, you'll see there's an LPG burner startup. We use that to heat the chamber. Uh, initially, and there's also an LPG burner in the flare, which we turn on well before we get pyrolysis to make sure we don't have emissions. We have a damper that you start pretty close and open up later. Now, there's a motor screw where the feedstock drops in from the hopper and is driven down uh, by the screw through a trough, right? And we have primary air that can get in by tubes uh, at the bottom there and the primary air goes up through holes in metal sheets that act as reflectors onto the trough and we have some primary air jets and so basically we get combustion or partial combustion of the syngas in that primary air and it radiates heat back down onto the trough that the material is moving through and then we have secondary air which comes through holes in the, in the side of the barrel uh, they're heated uh, in the wall between uh, outside a heat shield, so they're preheated and then they mix just below the chimney and we get good secondary combustion up there. So I think as a water spray, we know what that's for. It controls the temperature in the bed uh, at the high end in case you want to make low temperature charts. So we did some computational fluid dynamics on that to take a look at velocity vectors and, and the gas temperature profiles and the carbon monoxide and so on. And this shows the, the important thing, which is the bed temperature. The bed temperature without the spray at the hot end, and then the bed temperature at the hot end with the water spray, you can see we've been able to moderate the, the temperature, biomass feeding from the cool end. That's the implementation of that design. Just got finished as well. Uh, it's again at Russell Burns Place at Biochar Energy Systems. Uh, it replaces an earlier model he had that made, makes biochar that mixes with compost it's composted together and then pelletized. So you can see there the, the trough with the uh, paddles in there. Now what the paddles are for is they stir the, the char that's being made at the top into the material that's drying at the bottom and mix it. And when it gets to the end, it just goes over a weir and drops down into the, the biochar cooling box. Okay, so almost finished. Uh, the important thing is the integration of these systems into a whole system that provides a, a, a good end uh, goal. And so here, we're integrating into animal housing. You feed the uh, pyrolysis with manure and other biomass. You end up getting heat and biochar out, the heat for animal housing and chilling. 
And the biochar goes in as a feed supplement and is bedding and air filtration. And then the output of all of that, once it's all uh, matured in the animal house, can be composted and go into the pelletizing machine and you can export the fertilizer. Uh, and I'll finish up by just coming back to the real simple stuff again. This is a tea lot. Uh, but we wanted to be able to handle these difficult feedstocks, like this uh, type of thing Carlos talked about with sawdust. Our solution was to put a tube up the center that pokes through the, the grate that's at the bottom of the tea lot, uh, where the primary air is. Uh, so we get air up in the middle of the feedstock. The barrel can sit on a tripod, so you can just tip it over to empty it. And in the, where the secondary air comes in, we put a copper tube. You can see the water pipes coming in there, we get hot water out. We integrate that into a, a vermiculture aquaponic system. So the heat out from the biochar reactor heats the fish tanks, uh, and the biochar can go into worm farms. And we circulate the water from the fish tanks through uh, the growing system. And just to look at the implementation that Renato and I were down there last year building that at, at, uh, at uh, Stephen's place, Stephen Joseph. But the biochar can go into the water filter before the fish tanks goes into the fish tanks to form the biochar so it goes into the worm farm the worm just uh, goes into the into the growing tubes the worms go into the fish tank biochar goes into the the growing tubes so it's a, a complete system and then when it's all over the stuff the <coughs> biochar can go out into the regular garden so i'd like to stop with that and thank you